Well, hi there, everyone. My name is Scott Nicholson, and I'm a professor of game design and development at Wilfrid Laurier University in Brantford, Ontario, Canada. And I'm going to be talking about how to create a game for the Escape If game system that I developed. Escape If is a game system designed to help teachers in low resource classrooms or any classrooms create a cooperative storytelling game. Now, if you haven't seen Escape If before, this is not the best place to start because I'm not going to be going any more into detail about Escape If. You can find videos and more information about what Escape If is over at escapeif.com. So my suggestion is if you don't know about Escape If, stop this video now. Go to escapeif.com, watch the videos there, explore the sample games, get an idea of what it is, because I'm going to be focusing here on how to make Escape If games. Many of the resources that I'll be using throughout this are linked to escapeif.com. If you go to escapeif.com in the top right corner, you're going to see a link that says class resources, and that is going to take you to a set of resources that are designed to help you when you're creating Escape If games. There are two versions of this video. The version of this video you're watching is the longer version of the video. During this video, what I will do is I will talk about the different sections of a worksheet I've created to help you make an Escape If game. I will then work out and develop a game with you through this worksheet. So you'll be able to see my thought process as I made a game. You will see the challenges that I faced. You'll be able to see the final script of what that looks like. And then I encourage you to print out the worksheet, have it at your side, and then after I talk about each section, then pause the video and work on your own game. Now, if you'd like to have a shorter version of this video that does not include me working the example, you can find that link to at the class resources link at escapeif.com. So what is Escape If? Very broadly, it's a cooperative storytelling game. The escape word comes from escape room design concepts, and the if comes from interactive fiction design concepts. During these games, there's going to be two main things we do. We have choices and we have challenges. And those choices, the students will work in small groups. Uh, they will just talk about a choice and then everyone will vote on which choice they would like. And then the teacher will go to a different place in the Escape If script and continue reading the game. Challenges are kind of like problems in traditional classrooms. The students will work in small groups to solve the problems, but the problems will be set within the larger story world. What we're doing here is based around specific learning outcomes, but you can choose whether you're going to use an Escape If game first as an introductory activity or at the end of teaching something as a reinforcement activity. Again, to learn more about Escape If, visit escapeif.com. Now, the Escape If game scripts, if you haven't seen these, escapeif.com has the scripts. So the script is what the teacher reads, and that's what we're going to be focusing on today in this, in this discussion, is how to write these scripts. Now, in these scripts, there's going to be some content that is bolded, and there's going to be some content that is in italics. And the idea is that the teacher should read out loud the things that are bolded, and the italics are things that are instructions for the teacher. And that is a standard that you want to stay with as you write it so that if uh, someone reads one of your scripts, they'll know what to do with things. But we're going to be focusing on how to make an Escape If game script. Now, I should say, what we're doing here is not only going to help you make an Escape If game script, but it's going to help you with writing any kind of a story, with doing any kind of a narrative-based game. The concepts all hold true. We're just going to be applying the concepts to the Escape If game system. So the process of making a game, there's three main stages. You plan out what you're going to do. You then develop out that game, and then you test that game. Uh, and this is a cyclical process. Now, many people skip the planning, and they go straight, in, straight into trying to develop something, which is kind of like saying, I'd like to build a garage onto my house, and I'm just going to buy a bunch of wood and just go out there and just start building walls. You can build something that way, uh, but the chances that it's going to be a good garage and it's going to fit with the rest of the house are pretty low. And the same idea goes true here, that you want to spend some time planning out your game before you actually start developing that game. That's why I have this worksheet for you. The worksheet will lead you through the planning process and will help you to uh, take it step by step to have a better chance of having a good game on the other side. And then testing is a vital part of game design, but the reality is this is cyclical. You'll plan, you'll develop, you'll test what you've developed, and then sometimes it's right back to the planning phase where things didn't work out. Um, 
you'll see even during – as we talk about this process, there will be points where you go back and revisit things you've done before. So realize that making a game is not a once-and-done process. You don't do one thing and finish. You plan and develop and test and plan and develop and test and sometimes throw away half of what you made um, and go back into it. So this is the cyclical. It's an engineering process, and that's what you're doing here in game design. So you start out by thinking about who the game is for. Now, if you're a teacher, you know this because you're making it for your students. But if you're not, you want to specify who the game's designed for. A game designed for grades 1 through 3 is going to be very different than a, grade, a game designed for grades 9 and 10, um, even if it's on the same learning outcome or a similar learning outcome. So you want to define up front who is this for. You also want to think about in your mind the class size. Now that's only going to come into play at one specific point later on when we talk about physical activities, but it is something you should think about up front. Choices and challenges are mostly not affected by class size because the idea is that you're going to split the class up into small groups. You're going to have the small groups talk about what's going on. You're then going to have a vote or you're going to have the groups report back on what they discovered with their challenge. So you could do it for three students and you could do it for 300 students and it's going to be the same effect. Um, but when we talk about adding a physical activity, that's where class size will matter. You want to think about what time you have available for the game. Now this lecture is going to be presented based on a game that would take one hour or so to play. Uh, that's that's the structure that I found when I've been testing the games and making the games. What you're going to see is what I've learned works well for a one hour game. But if you have more time or less time, then you will want to not use the same amount of materials that I talk about in this lecture. So this lecture is designed around making a game that's about 40 minute game because you want to reserve some of that time, 20 minutes of that time for reflection and for overhead uh, for the game. You always need that reflection part. and We'll talk about that later. You want to think about uh, how experienced are the players at gaming. Now, there's two forms of Escape If. There's Escape If and Escape If Advanced. You can find them both at EscapeIf.com. If your players and your teacher are more gaming experienced, then they may want to have the Escape If Advanced version, um, which is not multiple choice, but it's more open world. Rather than me saying, do you want to go left or right, I would say, you're in a room with two doors, a window, and a potted plant. What would you like to do? So that those are different ways of approaching the game, and you can find the rule sets uh, for both at escapeif.com. And then you want to think about where this game is to be used. If the game is to be used before the players have uh, engaged with a the topic, then you would need to have more training in the game. So, for example, one of the games I made was about perimeter and area. Now, if that game is to be played before the students learn about perimeter and area, then when we introduce the challenge around perimeter, then the teacher needs to explain how they calculate perimeter. But if the class has already uh, explored perimeter, then this is being used more as an assessment tool or a reinforcement tool afterwards, then the teacher won't present that up front and they'll see, do the students actually know how to calculate perimeter? You can make games that do both. So you can create the game where you would put everything in place for it to be an introductory game, but there would be points in the text where you would tell the teacher, if the students have already learned how to calculate perimeter, then skip ahead to paragraph seven, and they would skip a section. So you can do games that do both. If you do that, you need to have the introductory concepts in there, but make them so they can be skipped. Kind of like regular video games. There's that skip button, so you want to build in your skip button. Now you want to think about the learning outcomes. So the learning outcomes in game design when you're making a learning game are your lighthouse. It is the thing to which you're always looking at with every decision you make. Whenever you make a choice, you say, does this choice take our game closer or further away from our learning outcomes? And that helps you decide what to do. And that's the difference between making a learning game and a recreational game. But in that learning game, you're always coming back to, does this take us closer to the learning outcomes? Now, for an Escape If game, the best learning outcomes are those that are specific and applicable to the real world. If your learning outcome is not applicable to the real world, I do not recommend making an Escape If game around it because you will have a very superficial game. Now, sure, you could have a story that says, I have captured you in my dungeon and you shall have to solve my linear algebra problems to escape. 
you could do that, but that's a bad educational game, and we're trying not to make bad educational games. So I would say, well, what are the real-world applications of linear algebra, and how do you build that into the game? And if your answer back to me is, I don't know, then I would say, well, then don't use escape if. Don't spend the time and effort to make a storytelling game where you're going to situate activities in the real world if you don't have any real-world applications for your learning outcome. Now, it can be useful to look at a proficiency framework. So the global proficiency framework is available for uh, math and for reading concepts between grades one and nine. Um, and these give you very nice specific learning outcomes that can be useful when you're making your game. I've got some examples on there. I've used these learning outcomes that you see on the screen right now for a game around feeding dinosaurs. And so the idea was that the players need to figure out how to add and subtract fractions whole numbers, mixed numbers, and those learning outcomes are very specific. So my suggestion is to think specifically about what you're going to be teaching with the game. So this starts us on our sample game. So the sample game that I'm going to create, this was inspired when I was working on a workshop with Rwandan teachers and asked them what kind of learning outcomes that they struggled with with their students. And one teacher said compound interest. Now you might think, well, that sounds dreadful. <laughs> But I decided to take that on and say, all right, let's make a game around that. So this example game you're going to see throughout this uh, presentation is based around teaching compound interest. And what you see here on the screen right now is the worksheet, and everything that's in yellow is what I've put into the worksheet. And you can find this worksheet already filled out in the class resources section if you want to follow along. So in this case, the learning outcome is that we're looking at concepts related to compound interest, things like the principal, the interest rate, and the compounding period. Uh, if you don't remember, the principal is the initial amount that you would invest in something. The interest rate is how much interest is earned on that principal. And then the compounding period is how often is that piled up once a year, twice a year, three times a year, because all of that makes a difference. Those are the three important things with compound interest. So the next thing you do is you brainstorm about what are the real world applications. Uh, so I thought of three, you've got taking out loans for your home or business, uh, working in the banking industry, or just investing. So this is what you want to start with is brainstorming the learning outcomes and the real world applications for those learning outcomes. So the next thing, now that you know your learning outcomes and you've thought about the real world application of learning outcomes, is to start to think about the story world. Now, the story world is the space in which your game is set, and you want to think where it could be. And I like to do this with a systematic brainstorm, where I take each application for the learning outcome in the real world, and I use it to think about different settings. I'll think about, well, what are the real world settings where this, this learning outcome could make sense? What are the historical settings? Are there places in history where we could look at a historical application of the real world. And this is where you can start to think about what's going to excite your learners. Or are there other topics in the curriculum that they're learning at the same time? So if they're learning about the Roman times, then you may want to think, well, do I have a way to apply this to what they're learning in this other class? Or there's the fantasy world. Now, fantasy is not just swords and sorcery high fantasy. Fantasy refers to anything that's sort of made up. Um, but thinking about are there futuristic settings? Are there past? Is it the caveman settings? Are we doing it there? Um, what is the fantasy world in which this could make sense? And I like to think about how we can add some playfulness to what's going on here. So, for example, um, uh, you could, with the fractions game, I thought, well, I could do a game about feeding animals the correct ratios of food. Um, but if I want to be playful with it and have some fun, I could think about, well, what if they're zoo animals? That might be exciting. And even more playful, I think, well, what if they're dinosaurs? I mean, that's even more exciting. So you want to think about how do you make things playful? Because if it's playful, the students will engage with it. And the goal is that after the game is over, the players should be able to connect the game setting to the real world settings. So if you did something with feeding dinosaurs food, then you could have the students reflect and say, now, where else might you use this concept? And it's like in cooking, you know, that's a real world setting. 
One of the things that happens with the story world that can get exciting is that if you are creating a series of games over a semester, you can use the same story world and make it more and more rich and get the students more and more involved. And that's where, for example, I use the Dinosaur Safari story world for quite a few of my sample games because the Dinosaur Safari world gives the students a lot of uh, excitement, they're raising dinosaurs, they begin to fulfill their role, they understand it, they understand what they're going to be doing, and there's a lot of affordances that it gives me as a designer. And I'll use that term throughout this, the term of affordances. Affordances are those things in your story world or your environment that you as a puzzle creator or a challenge creator can use to create your challenges and make them make sense. So in a dinosaur safari, you've got dinosaurs, you've got your customers, you've got feeding, you've got budgeting, you've got a lot of stuff to work with. Um, but you wouldn't have, say, a laser maze or something like that that wouldn't make a lot of sense. So you want to think about a story world that's going to give you the affordances, the, the, the things, the palette that you're going to create your game out of. It can be really neat as the semester goes on to continue to revisit the story world, to develop characters, and then at the end of the semester, have the students create their own chapters in the story. Because by that point, they'll understand the story world. They'll be excited about it. And then you say, well, what happens next? And challenge the students to make their own Escape If game based on the story world. And you could even share these videos with them in order to get them going. So in our sample game, uh, Here's my brainstorming process. Uh, so first, um, I took each of the real world concepts and put them in this first column of the table. And then I said, all right, so what's a real world setting? What's a historical setting? What's a fantasy setting? So I thought, well, how about taking a loan to start a business? All right. Well, there's a lot of real world settings there. You could be an entrepreneur that you're approaching a bank. Many other settings, too. Historical settings. So you could think about something that, that is meaningful to the students. So it could be that you're starting a video game company in the 1990s and you're taking a loan to start that. And that gives you a lot of affordances around uh, video games and things like that that the students might enjoy. Or a, a high fantasy setting where you are running a shop and you're going to supply the adventurers with equipment and you're going to the crown, the king or the queen to ask for a loan to start your fantasy shop. So those all are going to be the same concepts, but based on what the students might be engaged with. And you could, if I said, all right, now think about one in science fiction, you could come up with something. Or you could even ask your students, <laughs> find out from them what they're excited about. Or another option is, so in this case, you are the one that is getting the loan, but what if you're the ones that is giving out the loan? So in this case, being a banker. So this is what I call flipping the script. This is where you take something where you take the player and you put them in a position they're not normally in because you want them to understand the perspective of the other side. So in this case, if you let the players be the banker, they're going to learn more about the banking industry and why the banking industry does what it does. So the real world setting, choose to whom to give a loan to. Um, historical setting. So there's been a natural disaster and you've got to rebuild that area and use the bankers deciding what you're going to invest in. That might let you explore this, the history of the place where you are, a disaster that happened, or to be playful. You're a squirrel and you collected lots of nuts. You worked really hard to go to my bird feeders here outside and steal all the nuts from the birds and take those nuts. And you have the nut bank and the other animals are hungry and they're coming to you and they would like to have some nuts, please. So you could use, again, same learning concepts, but it's how playful you want to be with your students and what themes you think will engage them. Or we could talk about investing. So investing is a different approach. Um, there are different types of compound interest that come into play with this. In some ways, being an investor is more like being a banker, but it doesn't have that sort of commercial industry. Instead, you are looking at lots of options to invest in. So purchasing stocks, for example, would be a real world setting. You could build a whole game around that. If you want to look at history, my first board game was called Tulip Mania 1637, where people were buying tulip, the rights to have a tulip bulb, and the prices were about the price of a house at their high point. So you could build that a game around that concept. Or in sort of a fantasy playful setting, what if you ran a bunny farm? Because bunnies make more bunnies, and there's so many bunnies. So this is the brainstorming process that I go through before I start to, and, and you can see how I haven't really even made a challenge or anything like that. I'm just brainstorming what the possibilities are. The next step is to think about the genre of your game. 
So a genre is a, a shortcut for you. It allows you to make choices about your story and your story world um, and allows you to be consistent in those choices. It also helps the players to already have some comfort in what they're going to be doing if you've picked a genre that that they know. So if this were a movie or a TV show or a book, what kind would it be? So here are some of the some of the typical escape room genres that might be useful for you to consider. These are just a short list. There are many other genres, but this can at least get you thinking. So you want to think about an adventure. Um, so is the player exploring the unknown? Is it a mystery? Are you exploring a situation to solve a problem? Is it espionage? Are you sneaking around and monitoring what's going on and making a plan to try and accomplish a goal? Is it recovery? Is something missing and you're going to retrieve it? Uh, is it survival? You've been put in a bad situation and you just need to survive or escape. Um, is it a science game? Are you doing research about a situation, making decisions and creating solutions to, to resolve a problem? Or a nurturing game where there's someone else that has some needs or something else that has needs and you are trying to take care of them. And you want to think about as you're choosing the genre, you want to think about who the player is in that world. So when we do game design, we talk about the idea of roles and goals. So roles is who is the player and goals is what are they trying to accomplish? I find it useful at this point to think about what you've brainstormed and combine it with each of these. So think about your settings that you thought about previously and combine it to figure out what's a good combination. So let's say we decided that a dentist's office would be a good place for a story world. So if we were to think about each one of these to say, well, where does it fit with a dentist's office? Who is the player in an adventure set in a dentist's office. Well, it could be that the player is a, a dentist and one of the patients that they have, while they are digging around in their teeth, they find a hidden message that is inside one of their teeth and that triggers the whole adventure. Um, it could be a mystery that something's missing from the dentist's office or there's an unknown door that you've actually never been able to get open and maybe that'll take you somewhere interesting. Um, it's espionage. Are, is there a competing dentist and and you're trying to monitor on what they're doing because you think that they're sabotaging your your uh, your practice? Um, is there something missing? Are you is there or are you recovering something that's that's gone? The, the quest for the golden pick. Um, is it survival? Is it you are in your dentist's office and something goes wrong? The building starts to collapse or a fire goes off and you're just surviving. Um, science? Are you trying to improve your dental practice um, or nurture? Are you taking care of your patients and making decisions? And so you can see how each of these choices would create a very different game, but then you look at your lighthouse, you look at your learning outcomes, and you say, all right, if my learning outcomes are compound interest, which of these make the most sense? And you try to connect all that in together, and that's going to help you guide your choice. So in our example, we're looking to do science and nurturing. So the idea here is that we're going to do the bunny farm example. Uh, that seemed to be the, the example that jumped out to me. <laughs> Sorry, um, I'll, I'll hop right on those. Oh, stop it, Scott. Um, so we're looking at uh, science and nurturing. So the idea is that we're raising bunnies and you're going to put those together. So the player, their role in this world is they're a bunny farmer and they're going to be making decisions during the game about their bunnies. So that's how we're going to bring all of this together. The next thing to think about with your story world is who lives there? Who are the inhabitants in that story world? Um, because these are, again, we talked about the idea of affordances. So affordances are those tools that you have to build your game out of. So you're thinking about the world, but then you also need to think about who's in that world and what are the relationships with the player? What are their roles and goals? So these could be groups of people. So for example, in our game about uh, the dinosaur safari, we might have groups of tourists. We have the groups of dinosaurs. We might have the park employees. So all of these are different groups of people that the player may have to interact with or solve problems for. 
Or you can also come up with specific individuals that players will interact with. So Stanley the janitor might become a character that you continue to bring into your games. Maybe Stanley is the janitor that always gets the players out of trouble. So when the players have gotten themselves into a bad situation, Stanley shows up after hours and gives them the tool that they need to get them out of their situation. Or Dr. Emma is a veterinarian and they call on Dr. Emma when they need some help. So you can establish groups of people and you could establish specific individuals. And remember I talked earlier that this is a cyclical process. So you're gonna brainstorm things now, you're gonna ma start making your game, but then you're gonna come back and say, oh, okay, we need a dentist. And then you create a character for the dentist, and that's part of your story world. And then in future episodes of, of your story, if you're going to make multiple games, you can bring those characters back into play. Now, games are obstacles. Games are a, a presentation of things to make your life a little bit more difficult. That's why we play a game. We're like, you know, my life is too easy. I'd like to have my life be a little harder. Could I play a game, please, and have some artificial obstacles that I can overcome. So that's really what, what a game is. And so at the heart of the game of the challenge is the obstacles. What's in the way? Who is creating those obstacles? Why are they there? Um, because that's going to help you make a game that is consistent. This was a failing of a lot of escape rooms early on and triggered me to write an article called Ask Why, which pushed escape rooms to think about why are these things in the way? Why am I locked in a room? Why is the code for that lock written on the wall? Why are there black lights everywhere? Um, to think about who put these in the way and then make your decisions be consistent with those obstacles. So is there, who is the bad guy if there is a bad guy in the game? Um, who is the enemy of the players and what's their motivation? Um, now maybe that there, the, it can be useful to have it where the bad guy is not an enemy of the players, but the bad guy is an enemy of someone that's asking for help from the players. That can make the game feel less personal um, and help you feel like I'm doing some nurturing and helping you out because you're having this problem with this other person. Or is it the environment? This is where you know climate change, a fire is going on. Is, is something happening out there and you need to deal with it? Um, or is it a group? Is it some is it some kind of group that you've already established? So it could be a group of it could be a if you dinosaur safari, it could be a competing dinosaur safari owner and his henchmen on they all dress up as your tour as tourists to your park and you've got to figure out who they are. Um, are there multiple groups that are fighting? Do you find out that there's three groups that are all fighting each other and you're kind of in the middle of it? What's going on with that? So this is where you want to think about who is living in your story world. Then you want to think about who the ally is. So the, it's important in these games to have an ally. Now the ally is the person that they have a, several important roles. First, they typically will be the person that sends the players on the quest. They are going to be the ones that, because this allows you to get away from, if I'm doing something because I want to do it, then in the game world, I should have more knowledge about that situation. If I'm like, I want to go to that mountain and I've been researching that mountain for years and I know I want to go to the peak of the mountain because I'm going to have something there that I have figured out is waiting for me there. And I figured all that out. If you tell the players, this is who you are, you're going to the peak of the mountain, you've been exploring this for years. Well, the players should know a lot about that mountain. There should be a lot of things that they understand. But instead, if I'm going to get the thing for an ally, I got a letter from an uncle that said, hey, I don't know who else to reach out to. Um, if you're getting this, I'm dead and I need you to go to the top of this mountain and discover things and here's some basic information. Then it makes sense that the players don't know everything because they haven't been researching this for a long time. Instead, they know a few things which makes more sense and works well in this kind of game environment. The ally can also be someone that provides hints. So it could be that the uncle left some information along the way for the players to discover if they need help. Um, if the ally is alive, the teacher can role play as the ally, helping the students get back on track if they're struggling or giving them hints. Um, the ally can help make those real world connections or explore the impact of the player's decisions. Um, there is a plot device that is used sometimes in storytelling where the ally becomes untrustworthy. I would not use that plot device in these games. I don't. You don't wanna create a situation where the students in your classroom no longer trust you as the facilitator to help them with the game. 
So if I've established I'm your ally, then all of a sudden you find out I'm a bad guy. Well, then you're not going to trust anything I say, even if it doesn't make sense that you shouldn't trust. If I'm speaking to you as a game master and not as someone in the game, you're still not going to trust me as much. You don't want that to happen. So I suggest not using the unworth, untrustworthy ally plot device. So in our story world, now we know we're making a bunny farm and I'm going to be raising bunnies. So who's in the bunny farm? Well, we got the bunnies. Bunnies are in the bunny farm. Um, we have bunny suppliers, people that I get bunnies from. We have bunny scientists, people that are doing research on bunnies. These are things to explore. And again, I could continue to brainstorm this and come up with you know, the bunny customers and maybe a competing bunny farmer or maybe there's – something else going on. That's where we look at the next role where we look at who specifically is in the game. So the primary ally of the players, in this case, I thought, well, what if the player has just been left a bunny farm in their grandparents' will? So let's say the grandmother died and said, yes, this is your grandfather's bunny farm. Um, so you might find some notes left behind to help you out, but you're going to be running the bunny farm. So the nice thing about that is the players are not expecting to know anything about bunny farming because they just got this bunny farm. So they're learning things as they go along. So it solves that problem of why does the player not already know everything they need to know to make a bunny farm? And then uh, since we're going to be doing work with bunny research, we need a company. So we'll use Bunco as the bunny research facility, exploring ways to make your bunnies uh, make more bunnies. Again, this is iterative. So as you go along, you might say, oh, here's where the story can go. And then you come back here and add to this brainstorm or use it to rethink things as you go along. Where are the obstacles happening? Well, then I have – now I've got to decide, do I want to have the players competing against someone or do I want to have it just that they're trying to do the best they can um, to support the, the customers? So we're going to go with that. We're just going to go with the players want to be more effective um, in their bunny work. So now that you know the story world and you have an idea of who's there, it's time to make the story beats. Now, again, everything I've talked about up to now is just writing story. If you've done a creative writing class, you've done all this stuff. So there's nothing different between making it for a game uh, and making it for a story, except that one of the characters in your story is not controlled by you. <laughs> That's what makes it more challenging. The players are going to be there and you have to think about how they're going to be a part of this because you want to have the players have some agency. You want them to feel like feel like they have control over what's going on. Now, the reality is you have planned out all the possible paths for them in this escape if structure game. So they may feel like they know what's going on. The reality is they're just taking one of your previously dictated paths, but you want to give the impression of agency so the player feels like what's going on. If you want to explore that concept more in detail, I'll point you to the game, The Stanley Parable. The Stanley Parable, it's an indie game that you can find, and it is all about this idea of does the player really have agency or are they just fulfilling paths that have been previously laid out for them in games? Anyway, so when you're making the story beat, now this is for a 40 minute game. So I've boiled it down to what I have learned works. This is formulaic and it's fine because this is your first game. So it's fine to use the formulas. And then as you get better at game design, you can decide when you wanna vary from these formulas. So when I make these games, I think about three acts, and there's going to be three primary story beats, one in each act. Now, if you want to make a game that's going to be longer, that might take uh, several days to play, you can have multiple story beats in an act. That is typically what happens. So if you're writing a book or a movie, then each act is a major part, and within each act will be multiple scenes, and within these scenes will be different story beats. So, but for this game style, I have found that this is a great place to just to start. Three acts. Act one is where the players learn who they are. So something they do something in act one where they establish their role. They might understand a bit about their goal, and they run into the conflict. Now, there needs to be a conflict. There needs to be something of interest going on because if there's nothing of interest going on, well, then why are we telling a story about it? So you want to think about, well, what is the thing that is happening? What is the inciting incident that's going to get that player into the world? Act two is where the player then engages with the conflict. They start to figure out and start to resolve the conflict. They think they're making progress, but then you have the twist. Now, the twist 
changes things up a little bit. It changes some element of the game and makes this a little bit more interesting. So I always like to have a twist there in the middle. And then in Act 3, the players then move from engaging with the initial conflict to engaging with the twist, and they're able to then resolve the conflict in the third act. So those are your three acts. Start out by figuring out who you are and what you do in the world and what your challenge is. As you're resolving the challenge, then you find out that it's deeper than you thought. You go down the rabbit hole, something is different. And then in the finale, you get to wrap that up and wrap everything up together. So what is the twist? I've talked about it. Um, and again, I'm presenting you with a formula to start with and you can take it from here. So the, in the twist, something changes. So, so far you've made a lot of decisions. You've talked about who's in the world. You've talked about the genre of game. You've talked about where that world is set. You've talked about who the ally is, who the bad guy is, uh, who the player is, what is their role. With the twist, you're going to change one variable. Now you could change a lot, but that's gonna be overwhelming. And so what I like to do with the twist is I like to then go back to my brainstorms and say, what is one thing I could change to make this a little bit more interesting? So it could be that the bad guy becomes your ally, becomes an additional ally. Now you're working with the bad guy to resolve something else. And again, this is where I would not make it to where the bad guy um, turns on your original ally. You want, you want the players to have someone they can trust during the entire game. Or the place is not what you expected. So you thought you were in a dentist office and all of a sudden you're in an alien spaceship. Okay. Um, or the ally goes missing and the game becomes you're investigating a missing person. So the game might have turned from an adventure into a missing person investigation. Um, but so you want to think about some twist. And this is where I would avoid using the ally as the bad guy twist. So in our bunny example now, what can be our three acts? Now, at this point, just know that this took me quite some time to brainstorm. This is not a fast process. While it's gonna appear fast, like here they are, this takes quite a bit of time of thinking through what could happen, how could this all make sense to create three acts that are gonna to fit together. So in the first act, the players will inherit the bunny farm. They'll learn that now they have a bunny farm, um, but because grandpa died years ago, grandma still was alive, but then grandma left the bunny farm when she passed to the, to the players. The players now have some seed money, but they don't have any bunnies at this point. So now they have to decide how many cages to purchase based upon how many bunnies they wanna have. And they have so much money to, uh, to lay everything out. So they have to think, if I have this many bunnies, three years from now, how many bunnies will I have? And this is where we're gonna think about compound interest. In Act 2, there's a twist to make things interesting. So in this case, Act 2 is going to bring in the Bunco, the bunny researchers, where they have figured out a way that they could make bunnies uh, be breed better, make, make bunnies make more bunnies. And the players will have to decide, do I want to have bunnies that are more expensive but breed better, or do I want to just have more bunnies? And this is going to, again, be based on using simulation and compound interest to come up with an answer. And then the third is where you engage with that twist of Bunco. And this is where the players discover that by using Bunco's research, some of their bunnies are sick and dying. And they have to then figure out what's going on and make a decision if it's something that they want to actually pursue. So this is where um, three acts to tell a story. So you have the farm, that's your role. You're gonna decide how many cages that helps you get into the role. Now the twist is that there's a way to make your bunnies better. So do you invest in it? And then the impact is that that thing that makes your bunnies better also causes some bunnies to get sick and die. Do you stay with it? So there's my three acts I'm going to explore with my bunnies. But know that to get to that point, it took me a long time. Um, it took me many showers to figure that out. Showers are where I have all of my brainstorms, where I get things bubbling. And then in the shower, I'm like, ah, that's how we bring this all together. So know that this, this step will take quite some time to brainstorm and explore. And it does help to step away from your design for a while and just let things bubble around. So now that you have three story beats, you now want to tie in and make sure you can tie in the learning outcomes into those story beats. And this is where you're gonna go back and forth. Understand that this is not a fast process. So going between these three acts and learning outcomes, you're gonna hit that cyclical process here because you'll say, well, here's what I'd like to do in the story. 
but I can't think of a good way to tie in the learning outcome. So now I need to change what we're going to do in the story. Also know that you could start your design from any one of the three acts. That you might say, here is the big final engagement we want to have using the learning outcome. Okay, to get to that, where do we start and what do we need to twist? Or you might say, oh, I've got a cool idea for a twist that will help us with the learning outcome. All right, where do we start? Where do we go to? Or you might say, here's a good starting point for our learning outcome. Okay, then what's going to be a twist to make that more interesting? And then where does it go to? And I've made games in all three ways. So it's okay to pick any of these to start with. In bringing in the learning outcome, I like to use it in three acts as well. And so in the first act, it should be a relatively straightforward challenge, about a five minute challenge to let the players learn the methods of what they're doing to help them build confidence. Usually you wanna start with something relatively easy so the players feel good about what they're doing. Then in act two, you want to have them do a more complex version of the first challenge. So they've done the first challenge and now it's gonna get a little bit harder. Act three, then the players take what they've learned after the twist and they have to apply it to a different situation. So now that's going to, because if you want them to, to learn a learning outcome with real world implications, having to take the method that they've learned, a more complex way of applying the method, and then applying the method in a different setting is going to accomplish that goal quite well because it's gonna let them see their learning outcome in different settings and used in different ways. Now again, this is just a starting point. This isn't, you shouldn't say, well, Scott, I can't figure this out exactly. It's like, well, then make adjustments. But this is just a formula to get you started on making your game. It's now time to then go back and make sure you're still in line with your learning outcomes. Because you can get this far and you can get to this point and you can have veered off of your learning outcomes and kind of forgot about them or not included some of the learning outcomes that were important to you when you began. So at this point, I suggest you return back to your learning outcomes and just have another review and say, am I hitting everything? Am I missing some elements of my learning outcomes? What if I go back and look like with the global proficiency framework where you had these different levels? What happens if I look at a different level? Is there something that I can learn here? Is there some way I can improve my game? But realize this is part of that cyclical process. It's like, here's the story concepts. Here's how I can bring in some learning outcomes. Did I include all the learning outcomes? Or have I missed something? All right, I've missed something. Okay, now where do I insert something in the story to allow me to pick that up? And so it's the cyclical process, but this is an excellent point to go back and just make sure you're still pointing at the lighthouse. You're still on track delivering the learning outcomes. So in the bunny game, we are now looking at our learning outcomes. So we know you've got the bunny farm. So the learning outcome for the first level is Use compound interest to figure out how many bunnies you'll have in three years if you have X number of bunnies now. So if I have X number of bunnies and I have this breeding rate, then in three years, how many bunnies will I have? In act two, we now have an interesting choice. So we know that with X number of bunnies at this breeding rate, we would have this many bunnies. But let's say I had more money. Would it be better for me to buy twice as many bunnies or would it be better for me to buy more expensive bunnies that will breed twice as effectively? Which is going to be better and by how much? So that's gonna have the player take compound interest and apply it again and then do some comparisons and do a simulation to see well, which is gonna be better. And then we have the twist where we have some bunnies that are getting sick. And so now the players have to take into account, okay, so we have this better, these better bunnies, but some of these bunnies are getting sick how much difference does that make? Is it worth it for me to have bunnies that are getting sick or dying in order to produce that many more bunnies? In a learning outcome setting, what we're doing now is we're playing with the idea of paying off a loan ahead of time. If you think about the idea of having some of those bunnies die, it's the same as having a loan and the person is paying off some of the principal more than their basic payments and you get to see the impact of paying off that principal. And so that's going to be, now that's a bit, you might say, well, that's a stretch. Well, like that's why we have a reflection at the end to talk about that, to say, did you see how 
much your total bunnies changed after four years when some bunnies died each year. That is the exact same as if you have a loan or a credit card payment and you pay more than the base level that you're asked to pay, more than the minimum payment, you're going to see that principal decrease just the same way. And that's the aha that you want them to have. So now we go back and look at our learning outcomes. So we say, all right, well, what are the specific learning outcomes? Well, they're going to calculate compound interest over time. They're going to explore the effect of a larger investment, initial investment, compared to a larger compound interest rate. And they'll explore the effect of increasing compound periods. So this third stage of bunny is going to actually have the bunnies breed twice a year instead of once a year, and they'll get to see the effect of that. And then you go back and say, well, did we hit our learning outcomes? Uh, what have we missed? In this case, I see we haven't used, if we use this bunny analogy, we're not going to be using the terms compound interest and principal and interest rate and compounding period. We're not going to use those words in the game, which means we need to ensure that the reflection at the end of the game brings in those words because that's part of the learning outcome is to use those words. Or you decide to try and fit the words in. But in this case, I'd rather stay in the world of bunnies and make all those connections at the end. Now it's time to make the challenges. Now at this point, if you have not been following along um, and doing your own work and pausing after each one, I would suggest to stop my stop me now and go and start to fill out the worksheet because you, you really want to have thought about the story world, the roles of the players in the story before thinking about the challenges. Why? Because this is how you make a better educational game. So many bad educational games have been created over the years because people start with the challenge. They start with lasers shooting frogs and those lasers do multiplication before saying, well, what's the story? What's going on here? How does this all fit together? How do you avoid having the Dr. Evil's Labyrinth, where you will face the Minotaur of linear algebra, who will ask you linear algebra questions to proceed. We don't want to make that. We want to make things that make sense. So now that you have some affordances, where you have a story, you understand where that story needs to go, now you're going to fit the challenges into the story, and you'll have a much better chance of having a game which helps the players get involved with the story as well as then doing the challenges. Now, making challenges, if you're a teacher already, this is going to be easy for you because you've been doing this. This is where you're going to have the students do the things which explore the learning outcome. So these are where if you've been doing word problems or story problems already in your teaching, it's the same concept. That's what these are. But those story problems are now designed to help convey a larger story. They're designed to fit within each other. And that's the, that's the place where it's different, where rather than having three independent story problems, you have problems that tell a story as they engage with them because that helps to build the motivation of the learners. They want to be involved with what's going on. So this is where these challenges, you want to create them to help the players think about their role. Most importantly, though, you want them to help the players realize how they could use these learning concepts in the real world. And then you're going to build those challenges out of what's in the environment that you've created for the game. Now, if you're building a challenge and you realize, oh, I'm making a challenge and I need to use um, false teeth and I haven't introduced false teeth into the game yet, make a note because this means that later on we'll talk about how you round out the game. You need to make sure that false teeth get put into your world at some point. So if you need an affordance for a specific challenge, you need to make sure that, that, that you make a note to yourself so that you can make sure that's available for you to tap later on. And that's an important part of the documentation that you do when you're building these challenges. Most importantly, though, you want to make sure that each challenge matters. You want to make sure the players feel like what they're doing will make a difference. If I'm doing a challenge, but I don't feel like that challenge is going to matter at all to the story or to anything, I'm not going to be as interested in doing the challenge. So you want to make sure that each challenge that you do matters and also is aligned with the learning outcome. You could create challenges and say, well, Scott, why can't we just do challenges for fun? Well, here's the thing. The challenges are going to be the most time consuming part of the game. Your challenges will take half of your game time 
is doing these challenges. Well, you want to make sure that the half of your game time that you're using on the challenges leads towards the learning outcome. You can use the other half of the game time for your story and more fun sort of things, but you want things that are going to take some time for the players to do should be leading towards the learning outcome. Things that do not take a lot of time should not. So in uh, an example I gave earlier where I said, do you want to pick the left door or the right door? If that was your choice, if that's not learning outcome related, which it probably is not, I'm not going to spend a lot. I'm not going to say get into small groups and talk about which door to take because that's going to take up time and it's not leading us toward a learning outcome. For something like that, I'd say, do you want the left door or the right door? Pick one. Everyone raise their hand and we move on. So you want to spend a little bit of time in the game on challenges and activities that aren't related to learning outcomes, saving the bulk of the time for the challenges that are related to the learning outcomes and for the reflection about the real world outcomes of those challenges. <clears throat> so how do you make a challenge? So, and this is like, if you're, if it was an escape room design, it would be, how do you make a puzzle? Same idea. You know from your story world where you want the player to start. You know where they are when they start. You need to think about what do they know about the world around them and what do they not know? Because it's the not know that they're going to have to figure out because the player needs to get to a finish. So they, you have a place where the player starts and then you know where the player needs to be to finish, what their goal is, and how do they know they've hit that goal? That's something to always think about. Make sure the player knows when they have solved the puzzle or accomplished the challenge. Even if they don't know if they have the right answer, in this sort of challenge, they might not know that yet until you call people to ask them the answers. But at least they know that they have done the whole process and believe they are finished. And then the process to fill in that unknown to get from start to finish, that's where the learning outcome happens. And that's it. That's what you're doing in your challenge. You're establishing and you've established in your story, here's where they start. You you know in your story, here's where they're going because you already put together your three acts so you know this. And then the thing in the middle going from start to finish is the activity they're doing to connect where they were to where they need to go. And that should be the thing where they use the learning outcome. And that's that's how you make a challenge. This is not as easy as it sounds. <laughs> Understand that this is going to be a cyclical process that you're going to go through and try it and try it again and try it again and figure out how to make it simpler, where you need to add more information. When you make a challenge, it's going to be too hard. It always is the first time it's too hard. So you need to figure out how do you make it easier? How do you start the player, give them more steps ahead? Or how do you make the goal move closer to them? Or how do you make the, the give them more tools to accomplish the process? Uh, for example, if you were making a game about compound interest and you wanted the players to figure that out, you might provide them with a table to fill out to figure out the compound interest rather than just saying, figure it out for five years. That's a tool that's going to make it easier for them to make that path. Um, you could say, I'm going to work out the first year for you. That moves the start up a little bit. That also gives them some examples to work with. And I'd like to do that. I like to help the players out by giving them a worked example or working out part of the problem and then letting them go from there to figure out because that helps those students that might not understand the learning outcome to see how it's applied and then they're going to continue to apply it. At least for the first challenge, I like to do that kind of thing. So we'll go through my three challenges now for the three acts in a little more detail. So in Act 1, we talked about the specific learning outcome is calculating compound interest over several years. And what they're going to do is they're going to have to figure out how many bunny cages they need to buy in the future with their seed money so that they will accommodate the number of bunnies that they have now. So where does the challenge start? Well, the players will start with X. We have to figure out what X is. The players will start with a number of bunnies. And let's say they know the bunny reproduction rate is 50% per year. So if they start with six bunnies, then they're going to make three more bunnies in the year, and then they're going to have nine bunnies at the end of the year. So then if they have nine bunnies in year two, and then half those make more babies, then it goes from there. And so the players will be done when they figured out over four years. And this is where if you give them a table, they're filling out the table. They know where they're done, but the table will guide them through. Here's the number you had. Here's 50% of that number. Add those two together and take that total and move it down to year two. And that's your compound interest and in figuring that up. And that's the process. So you're learning compound interest. And there you could see how this could be used either 
as an introduction to compound interest where you could explain what's happening, take them through it very slowly to help them understand, well, you start with the total, you figure out the reproduction rate, the percentage, and then that you add that, that amount to the original and that gives you your new total. And all of those new bunnies are going to make more bunny babies. So then that moves down to year two and figure it out from there. Or if they've already learned compound interest, then you could not give them the table and say, you have 12 bunnies. You know that the bunnies are going to produce 50% of their number every year. In four years from now, how many bunnies will you have? And let them see if they remember how to do it. So there's two different processes based upon what, you ha what the players already know. So now I'm going to talk through the challenges I had in making this challenge. So I needed to actually bring numbers into it and figure it out. This is where you are in your challenges actually making this. So originally I just picked a number out of my hat. I said, we're going to do 24 bunnies and we're going to do three years. Now numbers like 24 are useful in making problems because they have a lot of numbers that go into them. You know, 24 can be uh, six times four or eight times three or 12 times two. Um, so there's a, and that, Many times that leads to better puzzles, easier puzzles to create. If I was to use 17, for example, that would be harder to deal with. So I like to use numbers that will give me uh, a lot of affordances in the sort of challenges I want to make. So let's say you laid it out and you laid out the table and you said 24 bunnies and then you tell the players, okay, so the first year, those 24 bunnies produce 12 more bunnies and that makes a new total of 36 bunnies. And then I realized, I said, well, wait, if we do that then the players don't actually have much to do at this point. They're only doing the compound interest calculation twice. Well, I've done it once for them and they only do it twice. So I thought, well, I kind of want to have them do it another time. And that's because your goal is a five minute puzzle and I felt doing it twice wasn't enough. So I added and made it four years. So that took me, I had to go back to the planning document and change three years to four years with 24 bunnies. And then I started to work out the challenge. I said, okay, so we have 12 bunnies the first year to give us 36. You move the 36 down, half of 36 is 18. Add thir 36 and 18, that gives us 54. We move 54 down, take half of that's 27. Add those together, you get 81. Move the 81 down, half of that is 40 and a half. Uh-oh, we have a problem. So the problem there is that the next number is not a whole number. And now I have to decide do I want to go with that or not? So do I want my challenge to have partial numbers? And if so, how are we going to deal with it? Adding in partial numbers adds in complexity because now 40 and a half, now your half bunnies is going to be a 0.25 and that's going to screw things up. So it just is going to continue to get worse. So you have to decide, are we going to have the players use calculators or are we going to give them another rule for solving the puzzle, such as round these numbers to the nearest one or drop any fraction that you run into and just go with the whole number portion. Um, I said, you know, I would rather not have, this is the first puzzle. I want it to be simple and straightforward. So I'm just gonna have to figure out a starting number that will lead me to having whole numbers throughout the entire table. So then I started to brainstorm what that could be. And I said, well, what numbers, because if you think about it, it means you're going to have to have a number that can be divisible each time by half that would work. Um, so I thought, well, maybe eight might work, but then I started to run eight and it didn't work. Um, so this was really just figuring it out and playing with it and trying to solve this puzzle myself so that I could give the players a more simple way to engage with it. And I said, well, why don't I try uh, changing the percentage? I said, well, maybe 50% is the problem. Why don't we try 25%? So again, that's because I picked 24. I knew that had a lot of numbers that could go into it. So maybe that'll be useful. So I said, all right, 24 bunnies. Now it's 25% of 24. That's one quarter. That's six bunnies. Now the players are going to have to figure out a quarter in their head. That's not awful, as long as the numbers are evenly divisible. So that gives me 30 bunnies. 30 bunnies divided by 25%. Yeah, now that breaks. And again, now you've got to decide, am I just going to say, it? well, we'll just use calculators, but we're making games for low resource classrooms where they won't necessarily have calculators. You could still do this math, but then I have to say is doing this math, what we want to pursue with a learning outcome. And I don't think it is. I think we want to keep the math part simple and focus on the concepts. That's what we want to explore here. So I said, well, let's change the percentage again. Maybe we'll just try 10%. Maybe that'll work. So start with 20 bunnies and they get two new and that's 22 bunnies. 22 bunnies doesn't go evenly into 10%. 
So I said, well, why don't I go back to the 50% and figure out the starting numbers? And so I, I thought about it and I said, well, you know, in that first example, when I had 24, it was good for two cycles. So what if I just figure out what number would give me 24 and make that year one? So you start with 16. 16, half of that's eight, that leads you to 24. And then we know from before, 24 will fill out this whole table for four years. Now, if we go into one more year, it breaks, but at least we can do the puzzle now. And this is the process of making the puzzle. Notice how it, it was iterative. I had to keep coming back and saying, well, that didn't work, let's try it again. And this is part of what you're gonna have to do with each puzzle. So now we'll talk through the other two acts. I won't go into as much detail about them. Um, so act two, we talked about the idea that we're going to be looking at high, changing that bunny reproduction rate, changing the interest rate. So in this case, I want the players to have to make a choice. I said, well, how do we do that? That's interesting. Well, that they can either choose to buy more bunnies or they can choose to buy bunnies that will breed more quickly. And if you want to make on the surface it being an interesting choice, you say you can either buy twice as many bunnies or you can buy bunnies that breed twice as quickly. What do you want to do? You could build into the game a reflection time before you solve the problems to ask the players to hypothesize about which they think will be better or will they be the same? Because they sound the same, you know, twice as many bunnies sounds the same as bunnies that breed twice as faster, but we know from compound interest it's not the same and that's what they're going to figure out. So the, that's their decision. They have to choose whether they, so they had 16 bunnies. Do they want 32 bunnies or do they want 16 bunnies that are going to make 100%? So 16 bunnies will double in the first year to 32. And then they figure out the tables for each one and they'll get to see what the difference is. And the, so that's going to be, they'll know they're done when they've done two tables. They compare the two numbers and say, oh, okay, it's actually better to have bunnies that breed twice as quickly, even though it doesn't look like it at the start. Um, because in the first one, you've got 32, and so it's going to start bubbling up. In the, in, in, in the second example, where they start with 16, they're at 32 at the end of year one. So in year one, the other group is, is doing better, but then quickly the double the bunnies every year catches up. So this is my act two. Now, I started to play with having the students also use formulas because you can figure out compound interest with a formula, and this is the formula that you see, and I worked all of this out to said, well, what if we start with 32 bunnies and 0.5 interest once a year for four years? Here's the formula. Here's what it comes out to. And here's the same thing where you're going to do it with 16 bunnies and, and the same interest. And I, I put this all in the game, but then I thought, uh, this is a lot to deal with. And many times when you're making these games, simpler is going to be better. The formulas, while they're interesting, they added too much complexity. And I, I thought, you know, the table helps you see what's going on in a way the formula doesn't. The formula covers up what's going on, but it is one, one formula and you're done as compared to figuring it out via the table. So this is something that a teacher can choose to bring these formulas in if they want. That's an advantage of the Escape If Games. It's all in a script. It's all in paper. The teachers can make those choices. So I said, I'm just going to remove the formulas because that's just adding complexity and time to the game. And I think we're going to hit the learning outcomes as it is. Uh, with because the learning outcomes were not around using the formula, it was just around the concepts. If I wanted a game around the formulas, then that would be different. That wasn't one of my learning outcomes. Throughout this whole process, it's very important to figure out when do you remove content? When do you take things out? Because by removing stuff, if you have five things, that could be overwhelming. If you take out two things, it's going to put the emphasis on the three remaining things and showing the players what's more important. So instead of trying to do five things fast, it's better to do three things a little more slowly and make those three be the most important things. So in act three now, we want to take what we did before and add some complexity to it. So they're gonna be dealing with the big challenge and this is gonna be looking at um, if that interest is compounded multiple times per year, because that's one of the other concepts we wanted to explore. So with bunnies, the idea is that now we're going to have bunnies that breed more often. So we went from bunnies that bred uh, twice a year or twice as much to bunnies that now could breed twice a year. And we're going to compare those two. So we're going to compare what about bunnies that breed twice a year at 15%? as compared to bunnies that breed once a year at 100%, what's the difference? And that's gonna help the players understand that when the interest is compounded more often, it's better. 
So first, they figure that out. They say if we had uh, 16 bunnies, but uh, they're going to be twice a year getting more bunnies at 50% each time and compare that to 16 bunnies at 100% once a year to see what the difference is. And it's a substantial difference. What's that difference when the interest is compounded more often? But now we want that final twist, that final punch. And in this case, the idea is that when you're giving bunnies uh, this medicine, it actually makes some of them die. So 10% of the bunnies die off each year. So now you have to calculate in when 10% of the number of bunnies is taken out each year from the pool, how does that change the number? And again, this is playing into the learning outcome that if you have a loan or a credit card and you pay off more than the minimum interest, you're paying off some of that principal, you get to see how quickly that number decreases increases as compared to just paying off that minimum payment. That's the idea of the connections. Now, this also opens up the door. If the teacher wants, they could open up a discussion about genetically modified organisms and GMOs and factory farming, and because that is the reality that when they do things to animals to make them have more meat or breed more quickly, more animals get sick and die. And so if this is something that would make sense for the class and the students would want to get into, the teacher could open up a discussion around the ethics of this. You could tie that into the game as an option. So then the challenge here is that what about these, these dead bunnies? Um, is this something we actually want to talk about? Because as I was writing it, I was thinking dead bunnies, but then I thought, well, in a class, you may not want to talk about dead bunnies. It is reflective of what's happening. Uh, this is the reality. And again, this is where the teacher could say, yeah, we're going to keep dead bunnies in there because that's what happens. Um, but what if we change something up? What if we um, made it sick bunnies or... What if we gave the players some choice as to what happens to bunnies when they're not as useful? So that gives us the inspiration for bringing a choice into the game. So now it's time to add choices. So we've talked about three challenges. You've brought in your three challenges, and now you want to think about having choices. So now the choices help you to flesh out the game. If there are elements of the learning outcomes you haven't addressed, then you could use the choices to bring those in. Or if there are affordances that need to be part of the game, you can use choices to bring them in. You can use choices to help the player get more engaged with what they're doing. But you want to be careful because if you add too many choices to the game, you can get overwhelmed. So let's say at the beginning of the game, you gave the players two choices and then you continued. Now, from that point on, you're having to create two different games. And then let's say you hit a spot and you give the players two more choices. Well, now you're having to create three different games and that can really get out of hand if you're not careful. And our trick with doing that as game designers is to have a structure like you see here where the players get a choice, they step apart from each other and see the impact of that choice, but then they go back together in the primary storyline. In this case, if we're gonna have those three acts, my recommendation is that no matter what path of choices the players take to get to it, they're all back together at the same time at the next act because that makes your life as a designer better it also ensures that you're not having to play test as many different things the acts are the more most important challenges because that's where the learning outcomes are brought about and if you have multiple challenges you're gonna have to make sure that one all the challenges test and they're all good and they all work and two all the challenges address the learning outcomes so it's as a designer my recommendation for you at this stage in your design is try to make sure that if you have a choice then it branches and comes back and it branches and comes back now at the end of the game you could have a choice that would lead to two different endings that would be fine because that's not going to result in a large branching structure after that but when you're thinking about your choices first you want to make sure the choices are meaningful if i say do you want to wear your red shirt or your blue shirt and it makes no difference in the game which shirt i put on then i don't want to put that in as a choice because players will see right through that they will then not trust what they're doing in the game. So you wanna think about how whatever choice there is will make a difference. So if you say you wanna wear the red shirt or the blue shirt, and then later on that matters because you're in a red room or a blue room and it's easier to hide if you wore the colored shirt that mattered or whatever, um, you want the players to feel like their choice had some impact. I like to avoid having clear right and wrong choices. Instead, I like to think about consequences. So rather than saying, oh, you chose the blue shirt, that's wrong. Instead, there's gonna be a consequence. And when I design, I like to make it such that each choice has benefits and consequences. So there's not a what's the winning choice to make here. Every choice 
is a different choice and it just leads you down a different path or opens up different opportunities for you. But make it so that it's not – you're not trying to win the game by making all the right choices. And you can tell the players that up front. If they're really upset about a choice, you can say, listen, in this game, you're going to have some choices, but understand that – there's not one choice that lets you win the game. Each choice just has consequences. And you want to think about how do you help the player understand the potential of those consequences. So, For example, in one of my games, I gave the player an opening choice of that it's you're going out to work at the dinosaur safari. It's going to be a warm day. You can choose to wear a short sleeve shirt, which will help you with the temperature but may expose your skin to brambles or other threats. Or you can wear a long sleeve shirt, which is going to be warmer, which could cause you problems with the heat, but you will be more protected if you end up in a threatening environment. Which would you like to do? Now there the player has a little information about what the impact is, is going to be of their choice. They don't know everything, but they can then talk about it and say, well, what do we want to do here? And they could say, oh, well, I know when I go, like myself, when I go out and garden, if I'm going to go garden in the raspberries and they've got bristles, it's, it's hot, I'm going to wear long sleeves anyway because I want to protect my arms. Now, that type of choice creates a variable. And I like to use variables in these games because it helps the players feel like they have agency. So if the player said, we're going to wear a long sleeve shirt, I would write on the board, long sleeve shirt. That's setting a variable. So it's just like programming. It's just like in a computer program where you'd set that variable long sleeve shirt. And then later on in the script, you would have the statement that says, if the players wore a long sleeve shirt, then read this section or go to section seven. If the players are wearing a short sleeve shirt, go to section eight. And that's how you do it. Now you can choose to either have that happen immediately. So in this case, that would be a variable that would happen later in the game. But you could also say, do you choose the left door or the right door? And that's going to take you to two different paths immediately to one of two different choices. But then the idea is that you want both doors to come back together. But perhaps they get different information in each side or they meet different allies or they engage with the story in a different way. Um, I don't like to set up punishment in, the, in these games. I, I want to avoid that concept of punishment because that's going to create negative feelings towards the game, especially if it's something where they're doing the learning outcome and then they get punished for doing the learning outcome. You definitely don't want to have that sort of situation. So that's how I do my choices is I either have an immediate story implication of what they've done or I set a variable so that later on we'll return to that variable and they'll see the implication of what their decision was. Now that variable could also be something like, um, do you pick up the fishing pole, yes or no? And if they pick up the fishing pole, you write, you have a fishing pole. So you can play off of old adventure game tropes using choices in the same way and have those variables be the things that they're collecting along the way. So let's talk about the choices in our bunny game. Now we've talked about a few of them, so I'll just show you how I documented it. So the first choice, which we've already talked about, is the player has to make that decision whether they want to invest in more bunnies or have bunnies that have a higher rate of replication. And then they make they can simulate them both and see which one they want to have. So the way I bring it into a choice is I start by having them vote on which they think is gonna be better. So they're guessing before they do the math. That's a good thing to do to, to get them hypothetically exploring a situation to say, well, what's our hypothesis? And then we'll test that hypothesis. And then you figure out the math to figure out which is the better choice. In that case, the decision doesn't have a consequence, but it's still important because it gets them, it's engaged with the game. It's not meaningless. It has meaning, but it helps them predict, you know, did you predict right? And if not, why did you think that? You can get them to actually reflect upon why they made the choice they did. Another choice would be at the end of the game. So they go through, they explore these different kinds of bunnies, and they see that um, by having the bunnies that breed more often, they still make a few more bunnies every year, but they have 10% of the bunnies that are sick or, or dead. And this could create an ending choice of, well, do you want to create a smaller organic farm where you don't use this bun co research? Or do you want to create a factory farm where you want as many bunnies as possible, knowing that some will get sick along the way? And that creates a choice. Now, again, that's not a learning outcome based choice. So that would be a choice I wouldn't have the player spend a long time on. But you could have two different endings to the story based upon what they pick. So now we can think about a choice that might have a variable. And so how 
would that come into play? And we've talked about the sick bunnies idea. Well, what if we let the players, to get them more involved in what's going on, the first choice they're going to have is what kind of bunny farm they want to have because there are different kinds of bunny farms. There are bunny farms where you raise bunnies for their meat, and then you're going to be killing the bunnies. And so the dead bunnies thing actually fits right in if you're choosing a meat farm. But you could also raise bunnies that you comb for their fiber, just like you would do with sheep, how you would get their wool. That's a type of bunny farming. So the players could choose to do that, in which case they might just be mangy bunnies or that you're going to have bunnies for show. You're raising like competition bunnies or pet bunnies. Um, so doing this at the beginning gets the players thinking about what's going on. And in fact, what I decided to do in the game is the players first decide what kind of bunnies they wanted to raise and then come up with a slogan for their bunny farm. So this is the opening challenge in the game to get them kind of excited about what's going on. Then based upon what they pick, there'll be then an impact later in the third act as to how the bunnies get sick based upon the kind of bunnies that they're raising. So as I talked about earlier, by this is how you show that impact. Um, so based on their choice, they're either going to have sick bunnies or mangy bunnies or grumpy bunnies based upon whether they wanted to farm bunnies for meat or bunnies for fiber or bunnies for show. So this is where the players see an impact of their decision in the game. The reality is it's not really having a big impact, but it's enough flavor to help the players feel like, yeah, I made a choice and that choice did make a difference. So notice how none of these are wrong or right. None of them are better than the others. They're just implications. They're just what happens when you make that choice. So now it's time to round out the narrative. So at this point now, you should have your three big challenges. You should have a few choices that would support those challenges that would let the players feel like that they're in getting into the role. And now you want to round it out. So you want to make sure that you're tying in the learning outcome to the real life use. So you want to think about how do you make sure that connection is happening. If it's not, then you go back and look to see where could I add another challenge or modify a challenge or where could I add a choice that would help the player make that connection between the learning outcome and how it's being used in the game world and eventually how it's being used in the real world. Um, we talked a little bit earlier about having an onboarding choice. The idea is that the starting thing you do gets you engaged in your role. So if you're deciding what clothes to wear, you're thinking about what am I going to do as someone working in a dinosaur safari? What's that first choice going to be? How do I get involved? If that first choice is not directly related to the learning outcome, I, I, use, I do it very quickly. I, I probably may only use a couple minutes of game time to do it, but it's enough to get the players immersed in their world and in their role. Or you could do something physical, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. The idea that escape games, one thing that's different with those is there's physical activities that people, uh, people get engaged with. The other thing to check now is to make sure that you have put into the game the affordances that you need for your challenges. That if you said you're going to have a challenge that's going to use frogs, that earlier in the game, frogs have already been introduced. So it's not a surprise when it's like, oh, by the way, you have frogs now. So you want to make sure that the, the affordances that you need for your challenges have already been set in play. The, the parts are there. The players then will feel natural. Why are we dealing with frogs? Oh, well, because we had to make these choices around frogs, and frogs became important at that point. So that's what this is good for, is to make sure that all your affordances are in place before you get to the challenges. So in the game, now to round this out, we need to think about our onboarding activity. How does the game start? Well, we need to start with the player's grandmother has died, and so it starts at the reading of the will. And then the players decide they're going to vote on whether they want to have meat bunnies or fiber bunnies or show bunnies. And then they figure out a slogan for their bunny farm based upon what they picked. And so everyone thinks of a name or a slogan, then everyone votes as to what they like the best. So that's a short onboarding activity that gets the players in the mindset of what's going on. You can then write that, that slogan on the board. If you're going to have an ongoing story world of the bunny farm throughout the entire class year, now you could have t-shirts or stickers made. You could really play into what the players have created during the game at this point. So 
physical activities. Now, these can be really useful. I like to use physical activities midway in the game. Uh, you can open with a physical activity, but it's not as effective. And the reason why is because shifting to a new activity in the class already gets your learners excited. They're interested in what's going on. But then if they're like, oh, well, all we're doing is figuring out compound interest and we're figuring out this puzzle and that puzzle, well, then their interest might wane a bit. And so that's where I like to have somewhere around act two or three, a physical activity to get them up and moving and engaged with the world. Now, we're talking about games for low-resource classrooms, so these physical activities shouldn't involve anything more than found objects. But you can do a lot with role-playing and found objects. There's a few ways to do it. So you can either set up that physical activity ahead of time before the game starts, so they may notice these things that are around the room, but they're not going to think anything of it until the activity starts. Or you could have a surprise. So uh, I had one game where it said you're going to put these things in a box and at the start of the physical activity, throw the box, empty it into the room and let them go and search, for example. Searching is a pretty simple physical activity. Go and find all of this. So this rock is uh, something you're looking for. You need to find as many as you can in three minutes. Go. And you might have hid them around the room. Now, here's a little trick. If the number of things they find is important, so let's say you're doing a math game and they need to find 16 things and you've hidden 16 things, they're going to go out and start searching for these things and they might not find all 16. What you're going to do is you're going to collect them all yourself and you're going to count them yourself where they can't see you counting and you're going to come up with the number that you need to come up with, which might be 16 or whatever. That's a trick as a game master you do. You're going to manipulate reality in order to ensure that the number you come out with is the number that you need to engage with your challenges. Now you could roll with it. So let's say you're supposed to have 16 and you only find 10. You could say, well, let's, we're just going to do it with 10. But that means you are going to have to, as the facilitator, make Make sure that 10 fits into the puzzles that come up. So the easier way is just to cover it up to collect whatever they found and give them the number that they need in order to make sure the game goes on appropriately. Um, if you want, don't want to do searching, you could do something that's related to the role that they have in the game. Uh, so they may, if it's an espionage game, maybe they have to sneak and you're the guard and you say, you have to sneak by me and you have to get to that point without being seen. And if you're seen, then I'm going to send you back and someone else tries. Or hiding. It's like everyone has to find a place in the room to hide. I'm going to be coming in as the guard looking for you. Or they're throwing something or they're building something. So try to think, is there something physical that we can do in the game that's going to map to our roles and goals and be something that's a little bit of a break from just answering questions and solving problems? You could also do a role-playing activity. That's something that's in a lot of these games where you as the teacher are going to role-play the security guard and the players have to figure out what to say to, to get past the security guard, for example. That may or may not work in your classroom based upon your students and your engagement with them. You could also have an observation activity. So this is where you've set something up ahead of time somewhere else and you send the players out to say, now you need to go down to classroom five and look at what's there, don't touch and observe this or that or whatever. You set something up ahead of time, or you're just having them go somewhere in the building to look at something that's already there to look for some certain details and then come back with that information. You could do activities where there's communication, where certain people can see something and they have to talk about it to other people and then describe it. So there's a lot of physical activities to do, but I like to put in a short and optional physical activity because not all classrooms will work with physical activities. And this is where I talked about earlier, you need to know for how many people you have. So if you're doing a searching activity, if they're looking for five things and you've got 10 people, that's one thing. If they've got 300 people and they're looking for five things, that may not work out. I tend to use formulas. I will say, all right, for every 30 people in the class, you're gonna hide five more things something like that, to let people find what's going on. And then you can still use your adjusting reality trick to uh, resolve it at the end. So in this case, in our bunny game, I was thinking, well, how do I add activity? Well, you're going to look for escaped bunnies. So this will allow us in Act 3, if you remember that they start to find out some of their bunnies are sick, here's where they learn they're sick. So it could be that I take 16 bunnies ahead of time, I hide them around the room, I take two of them and I, you know, I uh, color them a different way or something like that and let the players find them. And then I say, oh, you notice that some of these bunnies, so 10% of these bunnies are sick. 
And now you've seen – and this is where they get – they realize, oh, they've got some sick bunnies. Rather than just say you notice 10 percent of the bunnies are sick, you build that into the physical activity, that the bunnies have escaped, but two of them are sick, and that's a problem. And now you have to calculate that in your math. So that's how I'm going to put the physical activity and the aha of what's going on in Act 3 into the game. So now that you have your idea, your onboarding, you have filled in your gaps with choices, it's useful to make a diagram of your game. So this, and it doesn't have to be done in a computer, you could just do it in paper and pencil, but this helps you lay out what's going on just to make sure that you have in your mind how are things going to connect together. So you start with your onboarding, then Act 1 challenge, you may offer the players an item, Act 2 challenge, then they have a choice of paths, a physical activity. Uh, because the next step you're going to do is start to write the document. And when you write the document, you've got to have paragraph numbers for everything. And if you have made a diagram like this, you can then number each box to figure out what your paragraph numbers are going to be. So this tool is really useful in actually writing out the document just so you're sure you account for everything that's going on with your paragraph numbers. The final thing you want to think about is the reflection and that final activity. And this is where the learning happens. Um, Dewey, who is a, a, an educational theorist, talked about that we actually learn stuff by doing stuff and reflecting about that stuff. That's where the learning happens, is you do and you think about what you've done, and that's where you, you learn. Because if you just do, 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 but you don't step back and reflect upon it, the learning doesn't happen. Because in many cases, our story is going to have the players doing something that isn't a direct real world application, like, uh, the, but they'll be doing something that you could connect to it, that's where the reflection happens. So you may not actually be making food for dinosaurs, you may be cooking, and in a reflection, that's where you have the players think about, well, what were you doing in the game? And then where might someone do that in the real world? So the path that I like to take is to say, okay, where in the game were you doing the learning outcome? So where in the game were you calculating compound interest or using fractions? Where did that happen? And what did you do and how did they help you do things in the game? So make their connection between the learning outcomes and what they did in the game. Then you ask the question, all right, how in the real world might you use that? And you get them thinking about situations in the real world where they'd use that same learning outcome. I like to focus that into careers to talk about in what careers would you need to know how to do these things in, or around the house, when might you need to do this? When might your parents need to do this thing? You wanna create every possible path that they might have that aha between what they're doing in the class and the real world. You wanna seed that out. And so doing that path, and, and you want this to come from the learners rather than you tell them. You could tell them, oh, well, here's what you should have learned, and then here's what you should have learned, but that's not nearly as effective as having them have the aha, because many times they're going to come up with something you never would have thought of, and that's where you get to have an aha. Uh, now, if you're making a story world and you're going to be making another game out of the world, a fun thing to do right now is to ask the players, what do you think is going to happen next, and get their ideas. Because that's going to give you lots of ideas that will give you an idea of what sort of things they might get excited about for the next game and gets them thinking as a designer. What, what's going to happen next in the story world? It also seeds the thinking for later on in the class when you might have an end of class project to say, now you're all going to make an escape if game or you're going to make one challenge for a game. So I've done it where we think about the overarching story and then we assign each group a challenge. You're going to do act one challenge. This is what, So you're going to do act two, you're going to do act three, and you put that all together. Uh, when I did this in an escape room class, the way I did it as a class, we came up with the overarching story and the story beats. I then split the students into groups and I had three groups designing a challenge for each story beat. Then they all presented their challenges back to the rest of the class, and the class voted on which challenge they liked the best for the story beats. And then we patched that all together into one big game. So those are two ways to get your learners involved, to either have them make their own entire game or to assign them with specific story beats that they're going to make one challenge for. Because if you make a challenge around a learning outcome, you're learning how to teach that challenge, and that really cements what's going on. 
So in our bunny game, it's the reflection will be important because we're going to have to make connections between what they've done in the game and the real world implications of that. So they'll have to make, and these are, again, if the players aren't making these connections, then you may have to lead them into making those connections through action, asking questions. So the bunnies are like your money. The initial bunnies that you buy is like your principal. The reproduction rate is like the interest on the bunnies. And then the sick bunnies and reducing the principal is like having a loan or a credit card payment. And this is one, that one's a hard connection. <clears throat> That's one that the, you, you would probably have to lead the learners to think about, hey, did you notice this difference? Well, that's just like paying more than your uh, minimum payment on a credit card or a loan. And then you have to decide if you're going to open the Pandora's box to talk about GMOs and factory farming and that implication. Again, that might depend upon what other things you're learning in the curriculum. Does this tie in with something else that you're learning? Because the games can create those pathways that connect you from one subject to another. Now it's time to write your document. So you've been thinking about things, you've got some pieces, but now it's time to actually write the scripts. Again, go to escapeif.com if you need to see some sample scripts. You'll also find some templates there that you can work with to uh, help you get go faster in making your scripts. So I always like to start by writing up the challenges first. Uh, those are the hardest ones to write up. They're also the most important part. They also, as I write up a challenge, I may realize, oh, I've made a mistake, I need to add this, or I need to make sure that this piece is in earlier. So by writing up the challenges first, it's gonna help me realize if I've missed some things uh, along the way. I always make it to where anything that's in bold is something the teacher says, anything that's in italics is something the teacher does. That's the standard that I use for writing up these games. And again, you can just follow the scripts that they're all there in the Creative Commons. So you can take a script and then just replace it with your own text. I then, after I come up with the challenges, I will make my game flow diagram where I number the squares. So I'll, I'll write out each of the uh, each of the major areas and then number each square because the, the numbered squares are going to be the numbered paragraphs. So this is going to help me start to assign numbers to each section. I then start at the start of the document and I write the onboarding activity, number one. And then I say, might say, uh, and I try to make one numbered section be like a scene in, in, a, in a movie. So I'd have the onboarding activity to be scene one. Then at the end, I'd say, go to entry two. Entry two might be the first choice. Here's the choice. If they choose A, go to entry three. If they choose B, go to entry four. Then I write up entry four and entry three. Then at the end of both of those entries, it might say go to entry five. So that's gonna bring everyone back together. And entry five might be my act one challenge, et cetera. But if you've done the game flow diagram and you've numbered all of the major parts, then it's easy to create your numbered paragraphs um, and you spend a lot less time going back and fixing the numbers because you made a mistake. Only then when I've written out the whole game, do I then write the reflection at the end and then go back to the start and write the overall summary. I like to have a summary for the teacher to read, to understand the basic game flow, that's important. But I write that last, I don't write that first. Then it's important to start testing the game and I test it by myself first. I read it out loud, because when you read things out loud, many times you'll hear things that you didn't hear when you wrote it down. And I, I use what's on the paper I don't use my assumptions about what's on the paper. I read what's on the paper um, and, and then I follow the choices and I try to make sure that all the choices are numbered correctly. And I've always made a mistake. I've always messed something up and then I have to go back and fix the numbers. But you only find that by reading what you wrote. And that takes us into the most important part. Everything's the most important part, but the most important part of, of making a game is play testing the game. It's not just, I made the game, I'm done, let's run it with the class. You need to play test it, especially in these kind of puzzle-based games. And, and the maze, you will find that most of the time your game is too hard and will take too long. That is what we find when we make these kind of games. And it's because when you're writing out the game and the challenges, you have in your head what everything should be, what should be happening. You understand the situation, but the players don't. It's all new to them, so it's overwhelming. So it's going to be difficult. So you need to realize that. And the only way you'll see that is by testing the game on people. And when you test the game, read it from the script. Don't 
improvise. Don't say what you think it is. Read what's in the script. Try to run it just like a teacher would run it because you'd be amazed to find out what you left out. <laughs> there will be things that you left out of the script that you had in your head to write down but you didn't write down. And you're only going to find that out by actually testing the game with people. And then you'll see if the learners can solve your challenges or if they need more information or if they're stuck. Listen very carefully to what they ask questions about and figure out how could I resolve that? How could I make it so that people can be more successful? Generally, I like to make it to where the first act challenge takes five minutes, the second act challenge takes five to seven minutes, and the third act challenge takes seven to 10 minutes. That's about 20 minutes, and that leaves me 20 minutes in the game for onboarding, for my choice, for my physical activity, and then another 20 minutes at the end for the reflection. So that's how I like to time all of this out. If your challenge is too hard, you have a couple tricks. You can solve some of the puzzles for them and help them see how to solve it. You can remove stuff that's getting in the way. Don't put in red herrings. You have enough red herrings in the game. Don't put in things that aren't going to help them out. Um, you can write in hints that the teacher can give if the players are struggling, but I tend to not want to do that. I want to let the players feel that sense of success, but sometimes they are just gonna struggle. And then you want to make sure that you're applying that that you'll check one more time to make sure you're hitting the learning outcomes and they're being applied to the real world situations. And then in the reflection, they're reflecting that back into what's going on. Now, so far we've been talking about how to make these games for low resource classrooms, classrooms with just a chalkboard and found objects. You can you can add things to them. You can add other elements if you'd like. I would recommend that the base game you create is something that anyone can run in a low resource classroom because that's the goal is to create these games such that we can share them and that people can run them in their low resource classrooms. And any, and, but if you add additional assets, you could make them optional. Additional assets could be a worksheet, for example. So if you were making a game that had some relatively complex mathematics, you could create a worksheet that the players can use to assist them in making sure what's going on. So one of the games I made, which was for high grade levels, was designed around mean and median and mode. And there were times where the players had to figure out the mean, the median, and the mode of a fairly large data set. So you write all the numbers on the board and the players figure these things out. Having those on a worksheet would help the players to be more successful because they wouldn't be relying on copying everything down. But they aren't going to, you're not always going to have disposable paper and worksheets around. So I didn't want to rely upon that, but I could include it as an option. Audio can really help the players get into a mood. So if I was making a dinosaur safari game, I might use a certain theme park sound to get them engaged with what's going on it can really help with that onboarding process. But I would not run the same two minute song on loop for the whole 40 minutes. That will drive people batty. So use music, if you're gonna use music, use it infrequently. Use it to indicate a change of act. Use it to indicate a big thing. Use it to set a mood, but don't have the same thing playing again and again. And some students will not be able to focus if you've got music playing. So I would avoid having music. Don't play the Jeopardy theme when they're doing their challenges, <laughs> for example. Um, let that, so I would suggest having the challenges be quiet. Use music if you want to, to try and get people excited or sound effects, um, but they shouldn't be running all the time. Um, you can use digital whiteboards and uh, draw out pictures of what's going on ahead of time and then just call it up or prepare like a PowerPoint presentation where you just call things up on a slide. But I find that if you do that, you might lose some of the magic of the game appearing in front of the student's eyes because then they really think, oh, this is all created ahead of time. While if it's on the board and things are, you're writing the variables, oh, you're wearing long sleeve clothing and it does this then that's going to make the, make the game a little bit more magical for the students because they are part of the co-creation process. You could use all of this to make a digital game. And in fact, making escape if games is the first step. This is a step of making a branching narrative and a story is what you have to do before you're going to make any kind of a narrative-based game. 
that the students, uh, if you want to teach the students programming down the road, they could do this first because this is teaching variables. This is teaching if then. This is teaching how to write a story because you're going to build the game around that story. Because what I find what happens is if you give students uh, a computer tool to make a digital game, many times the first thing they will do is figure out how to kill things with it. How do I shoot someone? How do I do that? And then they slump the story on top of it and then it doesn't make any sense. So you want to start with the story and the sorts of challenges you want. You do the planning first, then you figure out what do I need to program in order to make the plan. You could use Google Forms or you could use Twine, which is a free tool to take and make a digital version of the game, but that's going to lose a couple really important things about EscapeF. The first thing it's going to lose is the students talking to each other. A lot of the magic in an escape if game happens when the students have that time to engage directly with each other, to talk with each other about what's going on, to make decisions about what's happening, and then see what happens. If they're all sitting at their own computers and they're not talking to each other, then they're going to be focused on winning the game, especially if they all start at the same time. They're going to be racing. And these games don't do a lot if you're just racing to just get the right answer. What's the right answer? I just want to pick something. Just click, click, click and skip. Um, instead of having a, a forced march through the game experience where we're all going to do it together, I know that the students are all going to have five minutes to talk about this thing and not just say, let's just make a choice to move on because they're going to be sitting there for five minutes and they know they're going to have five minutes to work on this thing. So they have that time to talk about it. It creates more time for the students to engage as compared to blow right through it. Because if these games were made, if you took a, an escape if game that took 40 minutes in the classroom with communication, discussion, debate, and, and turned it into a, an online experience, it might take you 10 minutes to blast through it and you're not gonna have the same impact. So having those group discussions is an important part of the escape if experience. The other piece that's really important is that if it is done through a script, the teacher can change the game. They can make changes as the game is running because they are making the reality come to life by what they say, but what they write on the board. If it's all in a digital spreadsheet or a Google Doc or a Twine document, it's gonna be a lot harder for the teacher to make changes. They may not be able to make changes at all, or they certainly might not, they won't be able to make changes while the game is running. And doing it as a storytelling based game, the teacher has the ability to adapt the game as it's running to better adapt to the classroom. And that's an important feature of these games. So while you can create a digital version of these games, know that they are most effective when the players have the time to discuss things, to make decisions together, and the teacher has the ability to adjust what's going on. So you've written a game, you've written a script, you've play tested it, you've run in your classroom, it's working, now what? Now we ask you to give back. Just like we've created all of these resources for you to make a game, now we'd like you to share your game with others. So the M Education Alliance um, will is created a repository for games. And the idea is that you can create your game and then you can put it into the Creative Commons just like everything else has so far and then upload it to allow other teachers to be able to use your game and to and to progress. I'm really excited about the possibility of having games that are created around stories that are from a culture shared with other people. I would love to see and learn about stories that your students are excited about. So getting your students to create stories based upon their own view of the world and then share those stories through these uh, through this repository. And this is where this goes is my hope is that by putting everything you've seen in the Creative Commons, by making it all freely available, will encourage people to make scripts. The scripts don't require uh, a lot of stuff to run. You don't have to have anything specific to run the game. So that's the goal of what we want to do with this project. So hopefully you'll be inspired to share your scripts, to have your students share their scripts with everyone else through the M Education Alliance. <clears throat> and with that, I am going to thank you for spending some time. Hopefully you can make some games and get some games out there. Um, Keep up with EscapeF at EscapeF.com. That's where I'll be putting more design tools and worksheets and everything that you need will be there. And feel free to share this with others because my hope is that by lowering the barricade to playing games and to making games, we can get more people engaged with the game experience. So thank you much and good luck. Bye-bye.